summer hat and <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> and I know you're some of the same people who um, aren't so obedient. So this is great. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, thanks for coming back. We like to get on time. Our next speaker is no stranger to the Schemmel Forum, indeed no stranger to thoughtful Americans at home and abroad. Once again, one of our nation's wisest and most important cons constitutional scholars is spending the Constitutional Day weekend with us, not with colleagues in New Haven or Washington or Philadelphia or Paris, where our, but here, right here in Scranton. So let's particularly give him a thank you for that. in the way of welcoming, welcoming Akil Amar back again. Welcome home. <laughs> well, it's a great pleasure to be um, with you all. Sandra is very hard to say no to, and, and, and so is Maury, I, I might add. Um, and um, a happy birthday, in fact, to, to Maury. He, he, he celebrates his, his 90th. Sandra and Maury are, are, are two of uh, my wife Vanitha's and, 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 and my closest uh, friends and oldest friends. Uh, when she uh, arrived in the United States, we, we got married in, uh, I think, September 3rd. And mid-September, uh, uh, we met Sandra and, and Maury. They were back at, at Yale. And uh, so they were really among the first people that she, she met here in the United States. Uh, um, so speaking of the United States, we meet uh, at a very interesting moment in our national history. Um, you've been promised um, a presentation on the Constitution in the headlines. Um, and we did that for a couple of reasons. Um, one, uh, to provide a beautifully um, uh, seamless, one hopes, transition from the fir that outstanding first presentation to the outstanding one that we're going to have after lunch. Note that um, in um, Adam's presentation, um, the words the Constitution appeared as Andrew Jackson, the Constitution and the presidency. So I'm going to talk about the Constitution and today and the media and um, uh, uh, what's in the news, um, uh, the role of the press. Um, it features prominently in mind, so I'm going to connect sort of um, uh, Adam's focus on the Constitution with the press and then we're going to hear about the present and the First Amendment and these things all connect back because of course um, and Adam also talked about the presidency and, and so we're going to hear more about that. We are in the age of, 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 of Trump and, and then there'll be more after that but I'm, I'm a bit of a bridge and a connecting uh, what came before the presentation that came before with what came after and um, um, I was a bad boy, Sandra. Um, one of uh, your colleagues actually reached out and asked me a month ago, emailed, so, so well, can you give us a description of the, of the presentation? And I didn't even get back to her because, no, I didn't and can't because how would I know a month ago <laughs> what was going to be in the headlines today? So we're going to talk, this is going to be a conversation in which you're going to tell me what you really want to talk about, you know, uh, from today, yesterday, last week, last month. Those are all headlines. And I'll begin in this improvisational way by riffing on that extraordinary presentation we just heard. I actually just um, uh, put in a few slides. I, I wasn't planning to do this, um, but the slides that I have up here are so profoundly relevant to what we just heard. There are only about 20 of them, and about eight of them actually uh, uh, are. Um, that's that. There he is, uh, Donald Trump. I mean, um, uh, uh, Andrew. Uh, uh, Andrew. Uh, they're, they're the same guy, you know. A uh, King Andrew the First, born to command. Had I been consulted, okay, and, and, and you see these connections. Um, that's um, Henry Clay, whom we heard about um, t uh, speaking and with, uh, with John C. Calhoun, who's recently been renamed Hopper, apparently, <laughs> um, uh, right here um, listening. There's a, there's a, he's got a shock of white hair a, a, as well in, in this. Um, uh, in this. Uh, so uh, 
Um, we saw pictures of the early, uh, of the co Congress building, here's one. But let me begin by answering questions that were teed up in that initial presentation, because this is the Constitution and the headlines. So the big headline is President Trump. He drives everything. Uh, and he is a lightning rod um, for good and ill. So why Jackson, n not Lincoln? Why Jackson, not Teddy Roosevelt? Um, those were questions that Adam posed. And, and here's the answer, you see. The answer is, um, so um, uh, geography. America does not divide, never has a really divided big state versus small state. That's what you were taught. Big state versus small state. That's why, that's why we have the Electoral College, Professor. Big state versus small state. Raise your hands if Mrs. McGillicuddy taught you that in eighth grade, because she, <laughs> she taught me that. And it's hooey. The big states do not now and never have had anything in common. Today, that would be California, Texas, Florida, um, and New York. They vote very differently. The small states, Rhode Island is very different actually from Delaware, and both of them are hugely different from, let's say, Wyoming and Alaska. America does not divide big state versus small state. That's not why you have an electoral college. And you were taught, oh, because they don't believe in democracy. They believe in a republic, professor, not democracy. Republics are indirect, and, and, and they were opposed to democracy, the framers of the Constitution. And that's why we have the Electoral College, so, so a wise group of electors could substitute their judgment um, for the masses. If, did Mrs. McKinley teach you that? Raise your hands. <laughs> Raise your hands high. I want to I see this. Because she doesn't know what she was talking about. And Adam told you, if you listened to him carefully, there's no difference between democracies and republics, which is why Jefferson's party alternatingly calls, call themselves the Republicans, the Democratic Republicans, um, potato, potato. If democracy is a dirty word, how is it that the dominant political party in antebellum America proudly called themselves the Democrats? Andrew Jackson is the dominant political figure in America after um, uh, the founders uh, leave the scene, after Washington and Jefferson until Lincoln. So democracy is not a dirty word. And from day one, the electors are, because that is in the headlines. The Electoral College had an inversion, you see. That's a bi the big headline is Donald Trump, all aspects of Donald Trump, how that happened. So. Um, from the beginning, people are voting for president, and um, uh, uh, the, the state legislatures aren't picking, and the electors are pledged, potted plants, just doing as instructed from day one in most of the states, by the age of Jackson, everywhere, basically, except South Carolina, by 1828. Every state is putting um, the, the, it's the presidency to a popular vote, you pick electors who are pre-pledged. They're, they're instructed. There's, there's no such thing, strictly, when you read, read the Constitution called the Electoral College. It's not a college. Scranton is a college. You know, <laughs> Yale is a college. Okay? <laughs> These people, they don't even meet in the same place. They meet in, today, 50 places on the same day simultaneously. They can't even talk to each other. They're not supposed to. They don't deliberate. They have to decide in one day. That's no, no faculty ever does anything in a day, <laughs> you, you know. They, they make Congress look efficient. They're not a college. I can prove it to you. They're not wise people substituting their judgment. Look, if I give you 30 seconds, you'll be able to name me three presidents in American history. I'm sure you can. And three senators, and all, you know, you can pick three out from, if I give you 30 seconds, you can pick three members of the House of Representatives, three governors, I'm sure. Name me in all of American history three famous presidential electors. <laughs> I can't. They are potted plants. They are nobodies from nowhere who never did not think so. You do not. They're just registering what the people have decided on election day. They're pre-pledged. You do not have an electoral college because they don't believe in democracy. 
They put the Constitution to a vote. Andrew Jackson's the dominant figure. He's a proud small d Democrat, capital D Democrat. It's not a dirty word. The electors are doing um, as, as told. And you don't have it because there's this division between big states and small states because that's not how America divides today. That's not how it's ever divided. I'm sure you know that the first president came from Virginia. And I'm sure you know that like, Virginia is a big state, in fact, the biggest. Um, and so too, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, that's eight of the first nine presidential elections going to a guy from the biggest state. And the ninth is John Adams, um, and, um, or, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, and, and he's from Massachusetts, which is the second or biggest, uh, or third biggest state, depending on how you count. And that's, and, and second or third because Pennsylvania would also be in the running. The three big ones are Virginia, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania. John Quincy Adams, another Massachusetts guy. The big state guy always wins. So if it's some balance between big and small states, how come the big state guy always wins? How come we've had three small state presidents in all of American history? Um, Franklin Pierce, Zachary Taylor, Bill Clinton, that's it? Um, that's not why you have an electoral college. You have it for other reasons, and in a word, slavery, because um, in a direct election system, the South loses every time because a huge percentage of its population doesn't vote. They're slaves. But in a direct election system, Virginia gets to count its slaves at a three-fifths discount. And you know who gets screwed by that? That would be Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania in 1800 has more free people than Virginia more citizens and voters, excuse me, more voters than Virginia, and fewer electoral votes than Virginia. So, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, I mean, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, these elections, um, uh, two of them. John Adams' son is named John Quincy, um, uh, and he's the one that Jackson loses to in 24, and bests in, in 28. Does America divide big state against small state? in these elections? Of course not. It's dividing north against south. That's the division in America. The south votes for the southerner twice. His name is Thomas Jefferson. The north votes for the northerner twice. His name is John Adams. And the election is decided in Ohio, which back then was called New York, which is where <laughs> north meets south. It's a slave state at the time. Okay, that's it. And you take away the 13, count them, 13 extra electoral votes that the South is getting because of three-fifths, because of slavery, John Adams would have won in 1800. And he knows that. So, so why not, Amer uh, why, why, why not um, uh, Roosevelt? Why not Lincoln? That's what was asked before. Why, why does Bannon pick Jackson? America, this is how America divides. North against South, okay? North against South. That's how we've always divided. From the beginning, just pull, I'm sure you all have your pocket constitutions you know, with you. Um, so look even at just how the names are listed of the signers of the Constitution. When you, it's, it's just, here's the order of the states. Um, um, it's, it actually it depends on, on the formatting um, uh, just because it's double column, but it's, it's north versus south. It's New Hampshire, Massachusetts, all the way down, Pennsylvania's in the middle, all the way down to Georgia. That's how they voted in the Philadelphia Convention. That's how they voted in the Continental Congress. That's how they voted in the Confederation Congress. America is divided north against south. And that's what this shows. Always has been. It's not divided big state versus small state. There's never been really any significant issue in American history in the last 200 years since the Constitution where there was a lot of big state, small state um, fighting in Philadelphia. But since then, the divisions have never been the big states on one side, the small states on the other, because the small states have nothing in common. The big states have nothing in common with each other. Um, it's north against south. It's coasts against the um, um, interior, um, and it's uh, cities against the hinterland. This is what it would look like if you looked at it um, by county. This is a recent uh, electoral, college, uh, electoral map presidential by, by cities, I mean, sorry, by counties. And so, you know, you see this little sort of thin strip of blue pretty much sort of along the coasts. 
Um, um, but you also see, yeah, there's some cities in, in the middle, you know, the, the Democrats, you know, will win Austin, Texas, or Atlanta, Georgia, or Boulder, Colorado. Um, don't be confused by n um, uh, New Mexico and, and Arizona. Those are sort of Indian reservations where no one lives. Um, they, look, they, look, they look very big on a map, but um, speaking of the Native Americans, another Jackson theme. Okay, so here's the drama of these two things. This one. Electric College map. Can anyone tell me the year? I'll give you a hint. Look at North Carolina and you can, you know, tell me the year. 2008. Right. Obama carried North Carolina in 2008 and he didn't in 2012. So this is not a 2012 map, 2008 map. I, um, what's the top one? That's an Electoral College map of 1896. Mm -hmm. And you see it's pretty similar. Yeah, Florida's kind of close either way. Virginia, North Carolina, sort of close. Um, uh, um, okay. But pretty darn similar, actually. Over 100 years apart, 1896 and 2008. And it's north against south and coast against the center, pretty much. And if you look at it more fine grit. But here's the kick in the head. Blue up there in the top, that would be the Republican Party. Okay, the parties have flipped. That's the party of Abe Lincoln and William McKinley and therefore Teddy Roosevelt. And that's not Trump's coalition. Trump calls himself, they call themselves the grand old party, the party of Lincoln. They're the party of Jefferson Davis. They're the party of the former Confederacy of white supremacy, of southern aggrievement, of Andy Jackson. Okay, so of course you're not going to call yourself Lincoln because the voters, the Trump voters, a lot of them hate Lincoln. That's why they have Confederate flags that they're parading around and Nazi flags, you see. So of course you'd never call, you know, um, uh, you never appeal to Lincoln because deep, deep, deep down in their, in their DNA and bones, that's not the coalition. The co you know, it's actually not Teddy Roosevelt whose mom actually was a southerner, um, uh, but whose um, um, dad was a very prominent um, Union Army person, or Union person. Uh, he wasn't in the Army. Uh, Teddy's trying to compensate for his, his dad's <laughs> lack of, of military service. Lack of military service has not bothered um, uh, Trump, and that's the big difference between him and Jackson is, you know, he plays a tough guy, and Jackson sort of was, a, you know, um, a, a man of, of arms. Um, uh, both private and, 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 and public. Um, so, where are the votes? The votes are in the hinterland. They're not on the coasts. And who's Andrew Jackson? He's, the he's born in South Carolina, but he's the first president from a state that's not a coastal state. You see, Virginia actually has a coastline. It's not a great one and not the great ports, but, but, but Virginia is a coastal state and so is Massachusetts. And just to remind you, all your presidents until Andy Jackson are coming from the original 13 colonies that are along the coast. There, there are um, the Virginians, Ch Ch Washington and Jefferson and Madison and Monroe, and the Massachusetts guys, Adams and Adams. Okay, so um, the new coalition and Bannon understands it. It's Appalachia, it's Scranton. Okay, this is where um, elections are decided in Pennsylvania. It's, it's. Pittsburgh and, and Philadelphia connected by northern Alabama, says a Carville. Um, and that's James Carville's line about your um, great state. Um, but Scranton actually swings. It, 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 it's uh, the Philadelphia exurbs and, and, and Scranton actually, which um, is, you know, not coastal, but is a bit of a city with a great university and, and, uh, and, and a little bit different than um, its environs. That's why it's a swing district, Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, and the like. Okay, so that's the Constitution. How is it that we get Trump? Why is he invoking Andrew Jackson? Because Tennessee, Tennessee borders, what, on seven states or something? It's a great, um, um, and if Al Gore had won his home state, he would have been President Gore. He lost his, his home state where his father was um, senator. So 
perfect sense to try to, you know, that's t the elections today, um, the Republicans, yeah, they need uh, Tennessee um, and Kentucky and, and states that border it. They, they, um, um, they, they're um, uh, appealing to, um, uh, in Indiana is an important part of their, their coalition. It's not a coastal coalition. Even though Donald Trump is associated with New York City, um, he actually is appealing to a different coalition, which we won't see if we keep talking this silly talk, oh, they left their colleges because they don't believe in democracy. No. Oh, it's because it's a balance between big and small states. No. It's actually about slavery, and we have to talk about that, and, and how, um, you see, Lincoln's not so um, uh, good from Trump's point of view and Bannon's point of view on uh, the race question because they're strong, because Lincoln is a strong racial egalitarian. Um, and actually so is Teddy Roosevelt compared to Woodrow Wilson, for example, who is, that's before the Democrats, you see, Woodrow Wilson became um, racial reformers, back when they were the party of Jackson and not the party of Barack Obama. The parties, this is a dramatic picture, because America divides the same way, but the parties have flipped. That's a big story of your lifetime. Okay, the parties have basically flipped, but, the, the, but some of the divisions remain um, very much the same. So that's the, the sort of thing that we're going to do. For, um, uh, you're going to ask me questions, and I'm going to talk about how something today connects to something rather enduring. I thought maybe just to get us started, I'd pick how Trump became, uh, Donald Trump became President Trump, because it is an electoral college story. And you might say, why, are we, why are we, we have this electoral college? Um, and I've given you some thoughts on that. And also thoughts, I hope, were very responsive to Adam's, I thought it was a, just a brilliant presentation, um, on um, how Trump is presenting itself, why he would pick Andrew Jackson. Um, uh, tough guy, anti-establishment. Um, but. Um, uh, I'll say maybe one other thing. Um, the book that um, uh, I have done, I think, um, uh, most recently, and I talked about it a bit, the Constitution today tries to take stuff from the headlines over the last 20 years and connect it to enduring constitutional themes. Now, it came out in September, and in September, the election loomed. You know, I actually thought that Trump could win. Um, and, I, um, uh, and my friends didn't because they're not spending time um, in uh, the hinterlands. They're just sitting in their coastal universities and thinking that that's um, America, and it's not. Um, uh, but um, here's chapter one of the book. So it, 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 um, it, uh, the, the, the book was more anticipating, even though if I, you know, I thought Trump could win, um, it talked more about the Clintons, for example, than it did the Trumps. But chapter one was America's presidency, call it a return to dynasty. Um, it's not just that Trump, you see, is a little bit like Andrew Jackson. It's that Hillary is a little bit like John Quincy Adams, Secretary of State, Ivy League pointy head, knows everything, but people don't like them. Okay, because they know everything. Um, 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 insider, establishment, seen as dynastic. Like the, you know, now, now, Hillary actually wasn't born to the position the way John Quincy Adams is, but I actually have reflections in this first chapter about whether marital dynasties are similar to or different from, for example, um, father-son dynasties. Um, there's a whole gender dynamic. But it's not, I, I think the, the Jackson framing is genuinely helpful. Um, you said you, know, you weren't sure, um, but, but it's not just on the Jackson side, it's on the other side too. She is, I think, eerily reminiscent of John Quincy Adams in certain respects, except that he managed to win, you know, and, and, and she um, didn't. Um, but um, you see this sort of, you know, Ivy League um, pointy head globalist type you know, against um, uh, a self-proclaimed, you know, person fr uh, from the people. But you see the different um, geographic uh, bases of, of these different um, uh, political uh, forces. So what else would you like to talk about? Now that we've talked a little bit about the Electoral College, a little bit about Hillary, a little bit about Donald, please. And, and we'll wait for the uh, microphone to get passed to you. Um, 
uh, right here. Um, and we'll see how many of these pictures I can actually um, uh, work in. There are only about 20. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, that's it. Okay. This is actually uh, George Washington's first inauguration since inaugural addresses were, were mentioned. I'd like your thoughts on the pardon by President Trump mm -hmm. of the Arizona Arpaio, Arpaio. Sheriff Arpaio. Yes. And how uh, that relates to the separation of powers. Yes. So here's President Trump. <laughs> um, and he's um, he got, oh, I'm sorry, Jackson. Um, and he has in his hands his um, uh, 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 Hogwarts um, uh, wands, the, 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 his, his um, maces, his, his great um, um, instruments of power. Um, and in one hand, you know, there is sort of the, the mace, as it were, but on the other hand, there's the veto. He, as um, Adam mentioned, vetoes 12 bills in all, um, more than all the previous predecessors combined, half of them on constitutional grounds, because he thinks Obamacare is unconstitutional. So, um, I, I mean, um, internal improvements bills of a certain sort. <laughs> so he, um, um, big stinky government projects of a certain sort that, that don't help his coalition. Um, and so he uses the veto, and that is a huge presidential power, you see. And so is, see, because there are the, at least two pens that a president wields. There's the veto pen, and he can, he doesn't even, if he's a very powerful president, he doesn't even need to use it, he just needs to wave it. Go ahead, make my day. Um, <laughs> Andrew Jackson doesn't actually, after a certain point, need to kill people in a duel. He just needs to start to like reach into his, you know, his, his vest and people cave immediately because um, they know what's about to happen. Um, he just needs to reach for his cane. He doesn't need to use it. So if you're very, very powerful, you may not need to, ve to ha use the veto plan, but you have to have it and you have to be willing to use it. But the president has two constitutional pens when you read Article 2. And one is a veto pen and that actually can be overridden by a two-thirds vote of the House and a two-thirds vote of the Senate. The other is the pardon pen, and that cannot be overridden in any way, shape, or form. It's basically an um, a a absolute. Now, here are the limitations on the pardon power. So he was completely within his rights to pardon Arpaio. So I'm, um, I'm not partisan, because if um, the powers that he has are the same powers that Barack Obama had or the same powers that Bill Clinton has. Um, and unfortunately, I think too much of constitutional law has been partisan. And one of the reasons that I try to write books locking in my positions is they're going to be the, they're not, because books are for a long time. Journalism is day to day, but, <laughs> but um, and that's the problem and the promise of, of journalism. But if I say 10 years ago, here's the scope of the pardon power when one, uh, uh, a party is in power, well that's going to be the scope of the pardon power so far as I'm concerned when another uh, party um, is in power, whether I voted for, for, for that um, person or not. So here are the limits on the pardon power and they're discussed in some detail actually. In this book I'm going to tell you a lot about the, how the pardon power um, was relevant in the um, Clinton impeachment situation um, with Ken Starr and before that with Richard Nixon. So I'll go back to Watergate and Lewinsky Gate, Monica Gate, um, um, uh, um, in telling you a little bit about the pardon power and, um, and that's this book ripped from the headlines. But an earlier book which I haven't plugged in the last 30 seconds, um, <laughs> which is um, uh, this one, America's Constitution, a Biography, this is more of a history book. This is a current affairs book. This one, the new one's um, uh, uh, dedicated to Bob Woodward. It's very much about the relationship between journalism and, um, and the Constitution's current affa affairs. This one's a history book. Uh, it walks you through the written Constitution from start to finish. And in fact, each of these um, pictures, this is basically, these are just the, uh, the, uh, the opening pictures for each of the chapters of the book um, in, the, in the main. Uh, there are a couple that aren't, but, but but, um, so I have a chapter, this is the opening chapter of a, uh, uh, opening page of a chapter called Presidential Powers. And in that chapter, and I think this is a beautiful embodiment of presidential power, um, King Andrew I. Now Andrew Jackson is actually a fairly low-born guy. 
and that's part of why he's a small D Democrat as well as a capital D Democrat, man of the people. Well, how, because if you've been to the Hermitage, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's like Miralago or something. It's actually a pretty, you know, um, um, impressive place. But he's low born, as are the Clintons, as is Obama, as was um, um, Abe, Abe Lincoln. But so why the heck could you call him King Andrew the First? You know, because you want to demonize that, because America actually, the American Revolution is in response to monarchical authority. That's why his loose, motley coalition of opponents, as, as Adam mentioned, called themselves the Whigs. Who were the Whigs in English history? They were the party that resisted um, um, a monarchical power. So, so the imagery is going to be King Andrew the First. It's, 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 you know, it's especially fitting when you think of King Donald as in the Donald, you know, as in the Earl, the Duke, the Baron, um, um, uh, and um, uh, so, uh, um, so that my chapter on presidential power in this book tells you about the veto pen, which is really powerful, and the pardon pen. Now, here are the limits. You can't, a president can only pardon for federal offenses, not state offenses, okay? And um, can only pardon, in the, um, can relieve a person of criminal liability, not um, um, civil um, uh, liability. So for example, okay, we won't use the federal criminal antitrust laws against you, but you might get sued by some um, a customer or um, a competitor for, for violating uh, the Sherman Act or the, um, the Clayton Act. Okay, so it's only for federal offenses, only for federal criminal offenses. It cannot be used to spare someone um, uh, from being impeached and removed from office. That's not, uh, that's quasi-criminal in, in a way, but the punishment for that is only limited to removal and disqualification. They can't put you in jail. Um, uh, the Senate and the House, if you've been impeached and convicted, they can't um, even fine you. They can't uh, um, cut your head off. Um, uh, so, and the president's pardon pen can't spare you from uh, the shame of, um, uh, of, and the political disgrace of impeachment. So only criminal, only federal, not impeachment. Um, um, I think it's the general understanding, and I'm very much um, of this uh, view, is pardon can only occur um, after the crime has happened. So we can't have prospective <coughs> pardons, although a president of the United States could say, get up every morning and say, everyone who's smoking pot in, in Colorado, uh, I pardon everyone who smoked pot in Car Colorado yesterday and all previous days, and tomorrow, my intention tomorrow morning is to do the same thing for everyone who happens to, to smoke pot today. Um, I can't spare you from the possibility of being prosecuted at the state level, but Colorado has spared you that. They've said it's not a, color, a crime anymore in Colorado. But you can't pardon, actually, strictly speaking, for a crime that has not yet occurred. You can pardon before there's a sentence, a con before there's a conviction, before there's even a trial, before there's even um, uh, an indictment. Um, and, um, and how do you know all of that is true in your lifetime? Who was pardoned before indictment, very famously? Richard Nixon was pardoned by Gerald Ford, Yale Law School graduate, Deborah. Um, and um, uh, Cap Weinberger um, was pardoned. Um, he had been actually indicted, but he hadn't been um, uh, uh, tried or convicted uh, by George H.W. Bush. Um, why would we have that rule? And I explain in this chapter why we do, because the president is a geostrategic actor, he's sort of commander in chief. All your early presidents, it's a foreign policy office, are basically um, generals, military figures, battlefield generals, and leading diplomats. The only person until Lincoln who's elected president who's not uh, a leading diplomat, typically secretary of state, or a battlefield general is uh, James Polk. That's it. Um, so, um, uh, Lincoln, I mean, sorry, um, until Lincoln. Um, uh, so Washington can beat the British and so can Andy Jackson and that's the, that's the biggest, you know, American victory since 
um, Yorktown, actually on the battlefield, maybe even bigger than that. It's a, it's a massive, um, lopsided, amazing victory. Now, in fact, peace had already been declared in Ghent, but word hadn't reached America yet, so, um, so it was, you know, fair. Um, uh, uh, but, but these battlefield generals, Zachary, um, uh, uh, Taylor, um, even um, uh, Pierce is a battlefield general, not a good one, but he is one. Um, but, but Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of State, James Madison, Secretary of State, James Monroe, Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, Secretary of State, uh, James Buchanan, Secretary of State, Martin Van Buren, Secretary of State. People who are Secretaries of State for four years, half of them become presidents of the United States. And the ones that don't become president this close, Henry Clay, Secretary of State, Daniel Webster, Secretary of State. That's Hillary Clinton. You see, she's going back to this earlier model. So it's a foreign policy office. How does that connect to the pardon? Here's how. This is what Hamilton writes about it. He says, suppose there's some insurrection or rebellion. You need someone, someone decisive, someone like Washington, someone like, like Jackson, who can just stride onto the, into the situation, because remember, Presidency is one person 24-7, 365, not in recess, knows his own mind. You know, Congress doesn't know, you know which way they want to go. So one person who looks those people in the eye and says, lay down your arms immediately and I'll forget about this. This offer is good for five minutes. And then, oh, beware. Okay? And, that's, and Andrew Jackson has that sort of decisive capacity. Um, and, and that's exactly what George Washington does in the Whiskey Rebellion, because you Western Pennsylvanians are really ornery, and you don't like paying taxes, um, and um, especially on whiskey, um, uh, and federal taxes. And so, um, and George Washington takes the field as commander in chief. These are presidential powers. Now you're seeing how these are connected. And he rides at the head of his army, uh, all the way, I think, to Carlisle. Um, and he basically reads the riot act to people and, 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 and three quarters of them pee their pants and leave um, and, and throw down their arms. He then um, uh, returns back to the national capital, leaves it to Hamilton to mop up. They, they capture a few stragglers. You know, uh, uh, um, they convict them. They sentence them. They try them to convict them in a fair trial, sentence them to death, and then Washington, because he's a very great man, and he's not actually vindictive the way some other presidents have been and, and, and may be today, um, he, as a matter of, of mercy, pardons um, the, the two people who are convicted. But he does so, for, you see, from a position of strength. Those of you who are parents, you, know, you can't cave on certain things. You have to, you know, you just can't. You know, they smell fear. Um, and, and so you have to establish what you can do so that from that position of strength, you can actually be merciful. Our pio is, it's the perfect. It, it combines all elements of, it's a perfect embodiment of Trump's vision. It's about him and him alone. I alone can do this because I alone have the pen. It's an act of, 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 you have to kiss his ring, so to speak, proverbially, bow on bended knee for, his, for the Don's uh, for, you know, dispensation, as in you know, Don Vito. Uh, that's with an E, but we could, you know, since we're into misspellings, we could, we could spell it at V-I-T-O as in uh, uh, Corleone. Um, um, so you have to kiss the Don's ring because he has the rings of power and, and, and maces and, and pens. So it's all about him and his personal act of grace and mercy. Um, and we're all talking about that, so there has to be something every day to talk about. And I think, I can't remember what he wanted to knock off the front uh, page of the news cycle that day, but he did. There was something, maybe it was Charlottesville or something, and, he, uh, and it appeals to his base. You know, and it's anti-illegal um, immigration, um, and, um, and he needs to uh, appeal to, um, I mean, Arizona is sort of, you know, part of um, um, his, his base. Um, and so it's a perfect embodiment, you see, and he doesn't have to give reasons. Um, and he, and he's, um, so it, it, it's actually a, um, um, a, a, a really beautiful case study of executive power a la Trump. And it's perfectly lawful. And if you don't like it, you can vote against him. Next time around, there's going to be an election. Um, um, 
Presumably he could be impeached um, if there had been some misconduct involved, um, but that's not going to happen given that his uh, party controls uh, the House and, and the Senate. And, but those are your checks. Was that responsive <laughs> to, the, no, to your question? Yes. But the impact yeah. on the separation of powers, yeah. where Arpaio was convicted of contempt of mm -hmm. court, mm -hmm. So um, I haven't plugged um, recently <laughs> this one from 2012, but there's an end note in this one telling you about a Supreme Court case um, uh, uh, authored by um, former Chief Justice of the United States, also former President William Howard Taft. The case is from 1925. It's ex party Grossman. And until last month, I was the only one of only two people I know who knew a case called Ex Party Grossman. But now, actually, if you Google it, lots of people are talking about it because it's in the headlines. And so, um, in Ex Party Grossman, the Chief Justice held that a president may indeed pardon for criminal contempt of court, something that previous presidents had done 27 times over an 85-year period. So, you know, um, this is you know, there. There are rules, and if that's what I thought. In 2012, before Donald Trump was president, when it was Barack Obama, that's what I'm going to think now. And I, let me tell you, there have been some stinky pardons. Mark Rich's pardon stank, and that's one of the reasons that Hillary Clinton lost, is that she owned not just everything she had done, but everything that he had done. It wasn't quite fair to always blame the woman for you know, all the man's misdeeds, and there's some gender <coughs> dynamics there too. But when did Clinton pardon Mark Rich? Ah, in the lame duck after the election, so there was sort of no uh, political accountability. When did um, uh, H.W. pardon Weinberger? Again, after the election. So the only political accountability has to be to your legacy or if um, um, one of your allies sort of runs. Um, that would be George W. or Jeb or, or Hillary. So the Clinton, uh, the, the rich pardon stank, and, and I promise you if you just sort of read all the right wing stuff, this was mentioned a lot against Hillary um, and in defense of, of the Arpaio thing. Um, I think that the, and I have some discussions of this about the independent counsel, um, if um, uh, until Ken Starr, pretty much if, um, uh, um, uh, and uh, except for, um, um, uh, uh, Archibald Cox and Leon Jaworski, all of whom were investigating presidents. But, but when you have an, uh, a prosecutor who's going after Casper Weinberger or a Scooter Libby or anyone else, if you want that independent counsel to go away, poof, you pull out your pen, you just say, this person is hereby pardoned and that special prosecutor has to go away. And the only people that you can't make go away with your pardon pen are people who are investigating you. Um, and, um, and that's why Ken Starr was different than all the other independent counsels. Um, and, um, and I do take the position in these books, I actually explicitly talk, believe it or not, in, in th two of these books written long ago, presidents can't pardon themselves. That's, uh, they can't, you cannot be a judge in your own case. That's a matter of first principles, rule of law. So that's another limit on the pardon. You can't take a pardon for a bribe. If you did, um, that would be impeachable because the impeachment clause, in fact, says treason, bribery, and, and, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. I'll say one of the things that you mentioned separation of powers, nothing in separation of powers ever, ever, ever requires that someone be in prison. Our whole system is designed to actually provide checks against being in prison or being convicted. So if Congress doesn't want to make something a crime, it just doesn't make it a crime and you can't be in prison. And that's, if the House doesn't want it, it's not a crime. If the Senate doesn't want it, it's not a crime. And even if the House and Senate both want it, if the President doesn't want to prosecute you, he doesn't have to and he can even pardon you. It's called prosecutorial discretion, but it's non-prosecutorial discretion, discretion not to prosecute, which is a lesser included to the discretion to actually completely absolve you with a pardon. And if a grand jury doesn't want to indict you, they don't have to and there's nothing you can do. And if a judge wants you to go free, she can let you free. And if a jury, thinks that you know, you've suffered too much, they can just acquit against the evidence. It's called nullification. No, and no one can do anything about it. There are six different checks against criminal law. Two in the legislature, House and Senate. One no, 
That's it, you're free. Two in the executive branch, grand jury and president. Either one says no, you're, you're free. In the judiciary, if either the grand jury or the pettit jury, um, I'm sorry, if either the judge or the jury says no, you go free. So the Constitution is happy when people are not in prison. It doesn't require people to go to prison. And if you think that because this person defied the court, Joe Arpaio, I'm no fan of Joe Arpaio. You know, I, I'm not at all sure, you know, if he saw me, you know, wandering around Arizona, you know, I, I, I know which side, you know, I, I'd be on in, in that. Okay, but, but, there's still civil contempt. The pardon power does not apply to civil situations. There are other mechanisms to um, hold him accountable. And um, we have too many people in prison already. And the pardon power actually is a great power. It is a power of mercy, but also of national security. Lay down your arms and, and I shall be merciful. It's a very interesting power in the Constitution. So I do hope now we've gotten to the bottom of it. But that's <laughs> separation of powers. Yeah. I want to go back to the uh, Electoral College, Great. which is derivative of, of the vote, of who, uh, who wins the vote in the state. But there are a lot of schemes that are going around uh, to suppress vote. And there are also schemes to try to get around the Electoral College when they thought that the Democrats were getting an advantage. For instance, in Pennsylvania, it was floated to do what Nebraska and Maine do and have the uh, 18 congressional votes go by uh, the way the district goes rather than the way the state goes. Um, I would uh, like you to comment on, on some of these. And also, sort of sub rosa, there's been a movement to uh, enact a constitutional convention. And I believe over 30 some states have uh, adopted that. I'm not sure if they've all used the same language and where you think that might be going as well. Those are all great questions. And if I um, miss one, please come back to me. Voter suppression. Um, it does exist in the last round. I think it, it may have been particularly possibly consequential in North Carolina, which is pretty close, controlled by um, Republicans who actually um, uh, purged uh, folks uh, disproportionately Democrats and uh, disproportionately black. Um, and, and likely Democrats. So it, it played, I think, a particularly uh, important role, possibly in North Carolina. I don't think it happened that that, that that much suppression happened here in Pennsylvania or in Wisconsin or in, in Michigan. So I think, but, but um, and, and, and if it happened in other places like Texas, I think they were going to go Republican anyway. Um, so I think uh, Florida and North Carolina were the two places um, and Florida also in 2000, um, where voter suppression you know, may have been decisive in swing states. Where are your swing states, by the way? Are they where big meets small? No, swing states are where north meets south, okay? Um, the, um, in 2012, only four states were decided by less than five uh, percentage points, and they were North Carolina, Virginia, um, Ohio, um, and Florida, which are all where North meets South. And you say, Florida, Professor? Yes, demographically, because um, all these New Yorkers are um, retiring to <laughs> Florida. And the further South you go, um, the more North it feels. I'm sure some of you have friends with um, timeshares and condos and, and, uh, in, in South Florida. So America presidential elections are decided basically where North meets South, these close states. So these are states that could have gone D, could have gone blue, but did go R in part because the R's controlled the legislature and suppressed votes. At least like North Carolina, like Florida. And that's where it matters a lot. Now, suppose, just a thought experiment, we had direct election. Now, parties are still going to want to suppress the vote if it favors them or goose the vote. Um, uh, uh, but Good government, nonpartisan people, newspapers, um, the press, um, independent citizens, in general, um, at the margins, see, if it's a direct election system and you're suppressing the vote, you're hurting your state. Because the more people from your state vote, the bigger it will loom in the national vote count. So at the margins, the good government people in the middle you know, will have another argument against the partisans who are trying to suppress. Let's go back to, um, since we have, we, um, uh, Adam talked about white men, and he actually said, and this is important, that 
Trump carried white women, and that was important. Barack Obama won women against Romney by um, about 10 points, 55-45. How did he do among white women? The answer is he lost white women and lost white women by 10 points. He won among women because he won massively among women of color, like 90-10, 80-20. Um, he lost married women, did Obama to, to Romney. But he won white women and he won um, uh, married women. So Adam mentioned sort of women. Let's go back um, so I can use another slide here, maybe two. So um, these are women um, uh, crusading for votes. Um, uh, um, this is marching down Broadway. Um, and I love this. I love the baby stroller. The only thing I don't love about it is it's white on white on white on white, which is why I follow it up with this is from uh, the, the March on Washington. Um, uh, you may have even been there, Kevin, or other folks from your, you know, from your, no, 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 from your, your class at Harvard, I bet, went down to, um, to, to, to be part of all of that. He, you were in college sort of in that era? Class of 62 mostly went, went south oh. to, uh, to Freedom Rides. Yeah, so this is the March on Washington um, uh, in 63. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so but women are crusading for the vote. Um, Woodrow Wilson is present. He's a Democrat and therefore doesn't believe in voting rights because that's what the Democrats you know, um, believed in post-Civil War. They didn't like the 15th Amendment. They don't want a 19th that's just like it except you know, no sex discrimination rather than no race discrimination. Imagine you had direct election. Well, in a direct election world, if the, ne the state next door to you is letting its women vote, and you're not letting your women vote, well, you just actually really reduced your clout in the election. In a direct election world, there actually are incentives to let more people vote at the margins. They're competing incentives to be partisan about the thing. I get that. But now we've introduced just um, a thumb on the scale of letting people vote because it's good for your state. Just like, you know, you want people who are going to put military bases or forts or spend money in your state or something like that. They might, they might be outweighed by partisan consideration. So, Voter suppression is horrible. You know, we have um, five, six amendments to the Constitution that say the right to vote. 14th Amendment, Section 2. 15th Amendment, Section 2. The 19th Amendment, uh, 15th Amendment, excuse me, Section 1. The 19th Amendment, the 24th Amendment, and the 26th Amendment. The latter two in our lifetime. No poll tax disfranchisement, no disenfranchisement on the basis of age. That's our lifetime. We put the words the right to vote in twice when stuff like this is going on. So, and I do discuss that, those six provisions in this one. This one talks about where the Warren Court came up with the right to vote. My claim is it actually is in the Constitution if you look at it with care. Um, and, and we're not do, uh, enforcing that, and the Supreme Court, to its shame and disgrace, um, <coughs> invalidated parts of the Voting Rights Act in a case called Shelby County that broke my heart. It's, you know, I will defend if you ask me, Citizens United. You haven't asked me. Um, but you know, I'll defend you know, a right to have a gun in the home for self-protection, um, um, if you ask me. Um, I'll say some conservative things. Uh, um, this is about having guns in homes. Um, uh, but, um, but on this one, you know, uh, when five to four, all Republican appointees, including you know, people I, I really do admire, um, invalidated the Voting Rights Act. That was, that was horrible. And um, so that's voter suppression, and we don't have a new Voting Rights Act, and that's a shame. And the people who voted for the Voting Rights Act initially, they were Republicans alongside Democrats. Uh, Rockefeller Republicans. That was back, I think, when, um, I can't remember, sort of when Specter switched from being a Democrat to a Republican and then back to being a, a Democrat. Um, um, but, but, um, uh, but a lot of Southern Democrats voted against it. A lot of liberal Republicans voted for it. You see, and both part, and that was one of the, the, the iconic moments in, in our, our history is a Voting Rights Act that both parties supported and now only one party is standing by. That's really unfortunate. Paul Ryan, shame on you. Shame, shame, shame. You know, so-called party of Lincoln, shame. Okay, that's a, now. Um, um, and, and that's why he doesn't want to call himself Lincoln because, you know, there are entailments if, if you do. And that's not his coalition. But that, that's voter suppression. Now, on 
Pennsylvania scheme, and it is a scheme. There are different kinds of things. If I like it, it's a plan. If I don't like it, it's a scheme. <laughs> um, here's why it was partisan and not right. They said, oh, let's do it by districts, and, um, and it's just like Maine and Nebraska. Those are the two that don't do winner take all. No, it's not like Maine and Nebraska. Here's why. <coughs> In Maine and Nebraska, no matter what, mathematically it is guaranteed that if a person wins the state, they get at least a majority of that state's electoral votes. It may not be winner take all, but it's guaranteed to be winner take most, maybe winner take all. Maine has two, here's how it works in Maine and, and Nebraska. If you win the state overall, you get two. That's for the two senators. The electoral votes are the number of Senate seats plus the number of House seats. So if you win the state overall, you get the two Senate seats, sort of, as it were. And you win, um, if you win a district, you get you know, the one vote, uh, the House vote, in effect, fr from that district. Now, if you win the state overall in Maine, since there are only two congressional districts, it's mathematically um, uh, necessary that you ha will have won one of the two districts. You can't lose both districts and win the state. So you have to have won one district, so now you get one for that district and two for winning the state, so you get at least three, maybe four, if you win both districts. But winner take most, maybe winner take all. Nebraska has five electoral votes. It's got three districts. So if you win the state overall, you have to have won at least one of the three districts. You can't lose all three districts and win the state. So it's one for that district, plus two for winning the state overall, so you get at least three, maybe four, maybe five. Now in Pennsylvania, you could win overwhelmingly the state, but because of the way districts are drawn, you could actually win a majority of the districts, uh, lose, me, lose a majority of the districts. You could win Pennsylvania 52 to 48 overall, and of the, it's 20 electoral votes? Um, you, uh, uh, yeah, 20 electoral votes. So you could have maybe eight electoral votes and lose 12. That's not unrealistic. Um, you know, you'd get um, six congressional districts plus two for winning the state. Um, and that's in part because all the Democrats have moved to cities. Um, they've clustered, and I showed you that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, so they're all in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, and you win those overwhelmingly. You win the state pretty handily, but you're losing most of the districts. Barack Obama lost a vast majority of House districts, in fact, even though he carried um, uh, the country by five um, uh, points nationally. So it, uh, and so it's a partisan thing. It will, it, it will advantage Republicans be, who uh, actually tend to win rural districts but by this much and lose urban districts by a lot. And, and um, it also introduces partisanship because you can draw districts. So it, it takes gerrymandering and puts it in to the presidency. Um, it's, um, um, uh, you, you, there's, it doesn't guarantee even winner take most, with, which Maine and Nebraska did. It was done recently, it changed the rules. Maine and Nebraska have had these rules for a very long time and they're not monkeying with them. So, so um, um, uh, now the electoral college today is not skewed powerfully toward either party. And, and it's not perfect, but it's not skewed. Why do I say that? You say, what are you talking about? Helped Trump, helped um, uh, Bush, W. True. But on election day in 2000, and I actually have some of the essays here, um, um, I, I, the day be, uh, it's po perfectly possible that Al Gore might have won the Electoral College while losing the popular vote. That's what many of us thought might have happened. And I prove that, and I, I, I have an op-ed in the New York Times that I wrote the day after the election, before Florida became a madhouse. And I'd actually written two versions of the op-ed the night before the election. One, because I anticipated there might be an inversion. One, you know, the Electoral College helps Bush, one, you know, which it would be. It wasn't skewed. Um, and, and when the election happened one way, I just sent off the, 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 the one version uh, of the thing. It was, it was overlap in most of the paragraphs, but just a little different in the lead and, and the conclusion. Um, in 2004, John Kerry, if 50,000 votes had changed hands in Ohio, would have won the presidency while losing the national popular vote by several million. Um, if a different Republican had won this year, it's not at all clear the Electoral College would have favored the Republican. Um, um, it did this time around because it, it, there was a lot of racial priming and especially about Hispanics um, of a certain sort. And um, uh, Hillary, the wrong kind, for, for the Democrat purposes, the wrong kind of Hispanics were in Florida. 
Um, and um, she was going to win California no matter what. She was going to lose Texas no matter what. Yeah, the Hispanic vote did help her in Colorado and Nevada, um, maybe also in New Mexico, but she would have probably won that anyway. But it didn't help her at all in North Carolina because there are no Hispanics, Ohio, Michigan, um, Pennsylvania, and um, Wisconsin. Um, so, but, a dip, but if it had been against Marco Rubio or, some, or Jeb Bush or some other Republican, so it's not skewed powerfully in my view. Here's actually how the Electoral College currently works. It favors the Democrats in that we Democrats tend to win most big states. We win seven out of ten big states on average. And with winner take all, that's a big boost, which you'll, you'll lose, you see, if you have the districts. There's no winner take all you know, bonus except the tiniest one. So Democrats tend to win, um, win most big states. That helps them. Republicans tend to win more states overall, and each state gets a bump up because of two senators, and especially states where no one lives, like Wyoming and, and Montana, the big boxes in the middle of the country. Yeah. Um, so now the Electoral College isn't skewed. The Republicans have one advantage, they win more states. The Democrats have one advantage, they win more big states, winner take all. You take away that winner take all, the Electoral College now becomes skewed in a partisan way. Finally. Constitutional Convention. When I was a young man, oh, the Constitution could be so much better, we should change all these rules. Now I'm an old man. Oh, it could be a lot worse. Um, and maybe I should just stick with what I've got. And partly I think that because I think our country is so divided now. A Constitutional Convention can only work if there's consensus to move in one direction or another. And there is no such consensus right now. We're very, very deeply divided and riven. So I don't think now is actually a particularly good time. It's not some deus ex machina. Let me say one final thing. There is another scheme out there. It's a plan <laughs> to um, evade, circumvent, modify, tweak, pick your um, um, uh, description, the Electoral College by saying, States can choose, it's called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. States could choose to give their electoral vote to the person who wins the national vote total rather than the state vote total. And if enough states do it, that's in effect a national popular vote because you win the national popular vote, you automatically win all these states and all these states together add up to 270. Formally, it preserves the Electoral College, but as a practical matter, it moves us to direct national election. How many of you have heard of that scheme? Some people think it's kind of harebrained, and, and, and it might be. Um, I'm the co-inventor of it, um, <laughs> and I think, and, I, and it's not partisan, but it might be harebrained. And I actually see there's some problems with it. There's another way of getting to direct national election that's much easier than that, and I do talk about it in the most recent book. If I can persuade four people, or actually really two, in the next presidential election, we could have direct national election. Two people, they have to be the right two people, and they're not Anthony Kennedy and, um, and John Roberts. The presidential candidates of the two parties could agree amongst themselves in front of all of us at the national debate stage that they will abide by the, the, the national popular vote. And their running mates would have to be on board, but their running mates today basically are lapdogs who do what the, the main candidates tell them. And I actually show how in that world you could actually move to direct national election as a kind of a gentles, gentleman ag agreement. Um, um, in the same way that we had a two-term tradition that emerged because people voluntarily stepped down. And Washington did it, and then Madison, uh, Jefferson and Madison Monroe, and then Jackson followed suit. And, and so you could actually move to a direct election through certain improvisations of an interesting sort. And I do talk about that in, um, there's a whole chapter in this book about the Electoral College. Yes. Yeah, uh, get, get, please give him a microphone. You just want to follow up here. Well, for, for you know, the record. Because um, we're, we're recording all this. Technical point on the Constitutional Convention. Yes. It's in the Constitution of the three quarters of the, three quarters of the states requesting it. Does the wording have to be identical? Are the motions that are going on available? Uh, many people decides whether or not the call to the convention is correct? Well, these are spectacularly good lawyers' questions. There are debates about them. My own view is that. Um, um, uh, I do not believe that a constitutional convention, if summoned into existence, could be limited by topic 
um, uh, the Philadelphia Convention ended up proposing whatever it saw fit, even though it was summoned to existence to just propose revisions to the Articles of Confederation. This is the issue of the so-called runaway convention. You think it's just going to be a convention about um, a line item veto or a national b b a balanced budget amendment or term limits. You, let's say uh, enough states actually say we want a convention for the sole purpose of term limits or balanced budget, line item veto. But once it's summoned to existence, I actually think by analogy to what happened at Philadelphia, it could propose anything. Therefore, I would say no convention call is actually valid unless it's a call for a general convention. Um, and, and, uh, but that's a contested view. Uh, my friend Mike Paulson has a different reading of it. He has an article in the Yale Law Journal called Toward a General Theory of Article 5. It's, it's cited in the end notes of, of, of this one, which I haven't mentioned um, you know, uh, uh, recently. Um, who would decide in the first instance? I think it would be Congress, because Congress is the entity that has to actually organize the convention. I doubt that courts would get involved, because there's a case called Coleman versus Miller from the 1930s that suggests that they want to keep their hands off the amendment process. Why? because some amendments might be introduced to restrict, to respond to court um, abuses themselves, whether you think that Roe v. Wade is one or, some, or, or, or anything else. So because amendments are sometimes in American history a way of, of smacking down courts, an income tax amendment, a 14th amendment that slaps, that repudiates Dred Scott, um, given that amendments have sometimes been an 11th amendment that was a response to a case called Chisholm versus Georgia, the court is hesitant to actually get involved in the amendment process. So it would probably be Congress, which is the entity mentioned in the Constitution, as the entity that's supposed to call yeah. the thing. Question that, that pertains to something that might not be in your book. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Heaven for fend. Okay, so uh, facial recognition software has yes. gotten very, got much more powerful. So now you can buy a phone that will recognize you and supposedly nobody else. Mm -hmm. So are we going to need a, an amendment, a constitutional amendment, for a right not to be recognized? <laughs> the Europeans have a, have a rule to be forgotten. So this is great new technology. First Amendment doesn't talk about radio um, or television or the internet, but we've tried to apply its principles to new technology by analogy to printing presses. The Fourth Amendment generally speaks similarly of a right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. And uh, uh, Justice Scalia, for example, says, oh, that applies when to thermal imaging technology that's actually um, where a kind of a magic ray gun was pointed at a house to detect um, um, heat. Um, and because uh, they wanted to figure out whether uh, marijuana plants were being uh, grown hydroponically under um, a hot la lamps. Um, and Scalia said that's an invasion of the home, even though it's not a physical, old-fashioned trespass. Why? Well, among other things, because it could detect the hour of the day in which the lady of the bath takes her sauna, lady of the house takes her sauna, takes her bath, and that's a kind of a private um, fact. More recently, the court, in a case called Riley, um, uh, talked about the uh, significance of cell phones and the need to sort of protect them, especially because they they're the modern equivalent of diaries. They contain so much of our life. They're like papers were diaries were for the founders. Um, the Supreme Court, a case called Jones, has said certain kind of GPS tracking um, uh, uh, technology does implicate Fourth Amendment concern. So I'm not sure we need to amend the Constitution. I think we need to apply it to new technology as we have applied the first to TV and radio, as we applied the fourth to, to thermal imaging and cell phones and, uh, and GPS. The Europeans do have an idea. This is not my area of expertise. I do tend to think it's a little screwy, this right to be forgotten, which is basically that there's a right to tell Google and the search engines they have to take down stuff that really did happen because you're now embarrassed by the high school, um, uh, a little too risque a picture that you, you know, uh, 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 sent to your yearbook. But, but if it's out there in the world, you know, I'm not sure there is a right to be forgotten. They want a right to be forgotten even for court records. Oh, that conviction um, was 20 years ago and, and um, 
Yeah, and you can understand why Jean Valjean wants to sort of, you know, put the past behind him, and and we, don't, you know, and Javert we just won't let it go and won't for, forget. So there's something in America, but I'm not sure that we can require the press to to like scrub the record clean and 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 like Kremlin-like, you know, erase pitch, uh, you know, p people from from the 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 the, p the picture and and rewrite history. That makes me very nervous. A right to be forgotten. As to facial recognition um, uh, software, I actually don't talk about it, but I do talk <laughs> about um, a, a comprehensive DNA database that I actually advocate and I say makes me really nervous. It's the piece in this, uh, but I don't want to rewrite history in the book, that I say, I said it then, um, I'm not sure it's actually right, but I really did say it. I have advocated basically that everyone be part of a DNA database. Not just people who are arrested, who tend to be disproportionately non-white. On the day of your birth, we take a drop of your blood and we test it for certain uh, medical things, um, but we also create a, a, a DNA fingerprint of that um, and, that, and we have it as your, that's your bio, and we have biometric ID cards and now in that world we can solve all these crimes because today we find the DNA but we can't actually make a cold hit because not everyone is in the database. But if everyone is in the database, oh, I can find every rapist immediately um, uh, so, and, or, unless they left no DNA. But that would be a good thing if they're using condoms and not, you know, um, and not possibly giving um, STDs or impregnating the, the victim. So, so I can solve all sorts of, of, of stranger crime. I can free all sorts of people who are wrongly convicted today and then they bring the DNA forward after the conviction and the prosecutor said, yeah, that proves that it wasn't your semen, but maybe you had a partner in crime. Um, may maybe there was someone else. Unless we know who it is, that doesn't really exonerate you. But if we know who that DNA belongs to, and someone who looks like you actually, and you, whom you never met, and has a track record a mile long of this sort of thing, well now that DNA exonerates you, and, and, and now you're free. More free people, um, it's gonna be harder to do identity theft, has all sorts of advantages. And it scares the hell out of me, and I admit that even though I advocated it, because, and here's what I said, I said it was kind of like fingerprinting in the, in the New York Times, but you know, it's actually not like fingerprinting in that a fingerprint can't tell me who my real father is, my biological father. Um, you know, this is sort of like, um, you, you know, Luke Skywalker or something, and, you know, so, but, but DNA can actually prove that the person who thinks he's my father and whom I think is my father and you know who my mother has told me and told him you know he's the father isn't at all and that's a very dangerous thing to give to the government that's trying to discredit political opponents and all the rest so so I propose a comprehensive DNA bad database and a very um, in, um, uh, important sort of a big regulatory statute that would try to protect privacy and you say yeah that worked great with Equifax didn't yeah. it professor yeah, yeah just, let's just create some huge th um, thing and, and protect it really well that's the Fort Knox strategy and yeah. it works for Fort Knox but 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 so I actually say I put this out I'm not going to rewrite history um, I'm not sure it's a good idea but I put it out for the consideration but 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 the world is moving in that direction. India has just proposed such a lot. Other countries are doing much more with DNA databases than we are, and, and we're moving in that direction. More and more and more people are finding their way into the DNA database. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I was gonna build off of that question, actually. Um, I, I would push back one on the, mm -hmm. the Fourth Amendment concerns, mm -hmm. I think. <coughs> Uh, so in Jones, you talk about the uh, GPS tracker, right? Yeah. But Justice Scalia, the basis for that decision was the physical invasion, not the invasion of the uh, cat's right to privacy, right? So it was actually placing the GPS on the car. So it would be different, for example, if they tracked your cell phone. Well, there were a bunch of opinions in that case, and that's not what Justice Sotomayor thought, and right. I'm not sure that that's how Justice Alito thought about the thing. So we may read Jones somewhat differently, you and I. Okay. Which is Scalia, I think, was the majority. Would he write the You'd have to double check. I don't. Uh, I, um, but well, but, um, but he's no longer with us. And if you're asking me today, you know, I think actually the physical invasion test was basically 
pretty much repudiated in 1967 in the case called Katz, uh, K-A-T-Z. So, so, um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, Telephones don't involve, uh, wiretaps don't involve physical invasion. So, so I, I think actually uh, Jones is more generative than, than, than that. Okay. Um, Akil. Yes, Maury. Uh, when you come in on the emoluments clauses of the Constitution and their impact on Trump? I don't think there'll be um, much impact. Um, and here are a, a few reasons why. Maybe at least three. Um, so I think it's a bit of a snipe hunt, just a bit of a distraction. One, um, it's not at all clear who has standing to bring a lawsuit um, to challenge um, uh, this. Now, two, what's being challenged, among other things, that um, people are, um, uh, foreign governments are renting uh, hotel rooms in uh, uh, um, uh, Trump hotels. Now, it's not at all clear that that's exactly the same as basically giving money into Donald Trump's pocket. If, you know, Donald Trump had shares of a company and they were sold on the New York Stock Exchange, you know, at, uh, anonymously where supply meets demand at just anonymous sort of prices and some of those shares were actually sold to some company, some foreign government that's paying fair market value from that, I I'm not sure we'd say that's some sort of um, money under the table. If George Washington had sold, um, he, he's a big plantation owner, a farmer, he's selling all sorts of wheat just at the market price. Um, he's growing, uh, he stops growing tobacco, actually thinks it's a losing proposition and starts growing other stuff. He, he was a very good businessman and, and, a, and, a, and a big real estate guy. Big, I mean, he's very land rich. He's, there's some analogies to Trump, um, um, but, but Washington has military service and virtue and, 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 um, and, um, and, and has a volcanic temp, uh, uh, temperament that he always keeps under control. He's very, I mean, he's a very great man and, and who provides for the freeing of his slaves at the end of his life, which the others don't, so there's some pretty big differences. But he is a rich guy, real estate developer, um, who runs um, real estate operations like plantations. But if he had, so, and he's a business guy, but if he had sold all sorts of his uh, agricultural produce at basically fair market value, who cares who's buying it because anyone else would have bought it at the same price. And he does sell a whole bunch of things and no one says, oh, that's an emolument. So I'm, first, I'm not sure who can sue. Second, I'm not sure that renting a room at fair market value is actually the, the similar to giving money under the table. And on the one hand, it's fair market value. On the other hand, it, these rooms would have gone vacant that day, you know, if that person, you know, so it's just money in your pocket. Or maybe not. If the hotel is otherwise booked up, someone else would have, you know, uh, um, law, um, uh, booked that room on, um, uh, you know, online, a, a, a price line or, or whatever. So, the, those, there's some very complicated questions of on the merits, is this really anything like an emolument? Um, and some have a broad definition of emolument, some have a narrow definition. Third, even if someone can sue, I'm not sure anyone can, and even if you think actually it's like a foreign government giving Trump money. Read the clause together, let's actually read it together. Congress is allowed to authorize all of this. And last time I checked, the President's party controlled the House and the Senate. So if really pushed, I think they'll just say, okay, it's fine by us, you know, um, as long as he signs our tax bill, you know, our, ta our tax cut um, uh, for the wealthy bill. So, um, uh, so I don't think it's a big deal, truthfully. Great presentation. I just wanted to dovetail on the privacy issue. Yeah. So no one wants to talk about guns? They had a gun picture here? <laughs> Citizens United? Okay. Just a, a one quick question. Yeah. The, uh, there's a, a woman from Harvard, I hate to say, you know, so a real professor, uh -huh. but, uh, named Shoshana uh, Zuboff, who has uh -huh. uh, this notion uh, that uh, there's actually a, a, been a misappropriation of our privacy rights to companies like Google, and we're going from a democracy to a kleptocracy or a corporatocracy, which uh -huh. seems to be similar right now. But, the, she argues that by misappropriating our private information that's gleaned from the, the Googles of the world, and it's being misappropriated, uh, she said there's a redistribution of privacy rights 
from the individual to the corporate entity. And we yeah. see evidence of that with the Google and the Facebook involvement in the election. And she said, you know, there's almost a notion of operant conditioning where they can take our own information and, and, and not just to do things that were against our free will. It's a, it's a really grand theory, but mm -hmm. I think it's an overarching concern that we all should think about, especially when we learn about all of the misappropriation of our of our rights under the last election cycle. So I just thought I'd put that out there because Good. it's a big issue. So here, uh, and um, uh, thanks for that question about Citizens United, because um, I'm going to answer <laughs> uh, with reference to Citizens United, just to show you that I'm not just a liberal Ivy League law professor all uh, across the board. It's connected. One, here's a conservative point. The Constitution basically creates rights against the government. Um, and almost nothing in the Constitution actually creates rights against private entities. Government can't discriminate on the basis of religion. But religion can. That's what they do. You know, to be the Catholic Church, you know, they say, well, you know, we, no Jews allowed, please. You can convert, you know, but you're not going to be a priest unless you're a Catholic. You know, and you're not going to be Pope unless you're Catholic. And they're allowed to do what the government can't do. And it's not just the Constitution permits that. It protects it. That's what the Constitution protects. Their right to, be, to discriminate against non-Catholics even, frankly, discriminate against um, uh, women. They can say, you know, men only for the priesthood and the papacy. And I know where I am here, and I'm, I'm saying that not to be disrespectful, but to, uh, you know, affirm their right to do what the government may not do. Um, uh, and so, too, the government can't tell you to um, vote for the Democratic Party. But the New York Times can and does. Um, uh, and it, it's not just that the Constitution doesn't apply to them. It pr protects their right to be liberals or conservatives for people or institutions. Um, private. Now, technically, you know, some of these big corp entities, even though they're pretty big, they're not the government. Um, and they're allowed, to some extent, to, to have a vision. The New York Times is or the National Review. Now, what happens when they have all this monopolistic power and they've acquired all this information? Well, if they've acquired by force or fraud, that's one thing. If people have freely given it to them, you know, if they've given up their privacy in exchange for convenience, that's a little bit different thing. Now, when they're so big, you say, well, they, they're, they're, that, they're monopolies. We have antitrust laws about that. It's a little more complicated when these monopolies also are sort of um, have informational power, media power. So it's not just, you know, it's one thing for U.S. Steel to be a monopoly, but it's just producing steel. Um, it's another thing, or Alcoa, it's just producing aluminum, for there to be media monopolies. That's, that raises some, some distinct First Amendment concerns as well as antitrust concerns. I do not blame Facebook. I, I, I supported uh, uh, Secretary Clinton. Um, and I have had and continue to have real doubts about Donald Trump, although I've tried to play it straight with you all and tell you, you know, that I do think he has, for example, a broad pardon power, a broad power to, to decide his immigration policies. You didn't ask me about that. But, but I voted against him. But selection was not stolen. We lost it. Um, Facebook can only put out information, but you decide, you stupid people, to pay attention to your Facebook feed rather than to actually you know, know stuff about the world because you're not reading op-eds that are telling you things. In the end, I blame the voters. Okay? One person, one vote, secret ballot election, on election day. They decided whom they were going to listen to and whom they, they, they weren't. Now, I think they should have been reading my books because, of course, my books are better than the crap out there. Y you know, um, but it's a free society. And, and so you can't blame Facebook or ads, Citizen United. So all these ads, the ads mean nothing at all unless people are persuaded by them. Linda McMahon, she spent $80 million on all these ads. Um, I mean, the number may be wrong. And, and she ran for the Senate twice in my state. People didn't like her. I, we voted against her. And the more ads she ran, the more people disliked her. I thought, is, it, is this a great country or what? She's spending all this money in our state. We get to vote against her. Meg Whitman way outspent Jerry Brown. Jerry Brown kicked her butt because, you know, um, uh, Carly Fiorina could spend a lot of money. People don't like her. Donald Trump spent nothing at all in the primaries, all earned media, free media. Jeb Bush, that's where the 80 million comes from. Jeb Bush spent 80 million. Didn't help him very much. Didn't help. So, 
in my view, spend all you want on ads. That's freedom of speech, freedom of the press, more precisely. The New York Times can uh, editorialize, vote for this, but you decide whether you're going to follow that ad, that editorial endorsement, that media outlet's favorable coverage or unfavorable coverage. People get to decide whom they trust. I think they're making bad decisions, but the fault is not Mark Zuckerberg's or um, uh, uh, Bannon's alone or Breitbart. It's the voters, and thus it must be necessarily, you know, in a democracy, in a we the people um, system in, in which, as, uh, and this is, I know I end, this is how um, um, Sandra began. She said, it's a we the people project, and it will fail when we the people actually stop doing our duty. There's not just freedom of speech, in my view. There's a duty to listen and actually to listen to both sides and you can't, there are responsibilities and you can't faithfully, the system doesn't work if people don't vote and it doesn't work if voters actually don't spend time to really investigate the issues and I think a lot of people weren't but I don't blame Facebook. You know, I blame, you know, my fellow citizens, truth be told. Well, give us Citizens United and dark money. But that was Citizens United. Citizens United, the government tried to shut down political ads saying Hillary's a monster. You can't do that. I don't believe she's a monster, but of course you can't actually make it illegal for people to run an, an, a movie or an ad saying vote against Hillary. They get to do that. That's like con law 101. This is not a hard case on the facts. On the facts of the case, this was about, um, and you say, oh, it's a corporation. Well, so is the New York Times, and I wouldn't want the government to be able to shut down it or ESPN, um, or um, uh, uh, Time Magazine. Um, and by the way, the Catholic Church is a corporation, and so is Yale University, and, and so is NPR, and so um, uh, the New York Times is allowed to editorialize. And you say, oh, well, that's an editorial, that's not an ad. Oh, I see the difference. Or you say, oh, no, um, when, when uh, Exxon Mobil runs an ad, that's wrong, um, but when the New York Times, Oh, that's a media corporation. Oh, I see the difference. So now if ExxonMobil buys the New York Times, it can do this, you know. Or, oh, it's different because, oh, there's a corporation, not a rich person. Rich people can spend money out of their pocket. That doesn't count, but a corporation can't. None of these make sense. Ads are perfectly okay, and they work only if citizens are persuaded. So Citizens United says you've got to be able to run ads. Say that you've had some food for thought. <laughs> well, we have that other kind of food too on the fifth floor, and I'm sure that you will continue the conversation and um, um, come back for um, the next next uh, next talk. Will be at 1:45, so you can have a leisurely lunch, relax. Sandra.